Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today we are going global once again. It is the last Friday of the month, and we are talking about global issues happening around the world. In our first edition, we talked about the ongoing issues that were going on in the House of Commons in Britain and Boris Johnson. And today we're going, we're staying in Europe a little bit, and we're going across the pond to Ukraine. And we are talking with the uh, Ukrainian journalist, Maria Romanenko. Maria, thank you so much for doing this. This is going to be a fun uh, 45 minutes, an hour, depending on how much we like to talk about Ukraine and the issues that are going on in the Western border. So thank you. Thank you for having me, Chris. So I, I got to start the age old question um, because people might go, who is this woman and why should we be paying attention to her? Um, you are a Ukrainian journalist. How did you get into journalism and started covering the Ukrainian politics and ongoing issues that we've seen in the last few months? Where did you, where did you get your start in journalism? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So um, I think it probably, so I, you know, even though I'm Ukrainian, I uh, was born here and I sort of lived here almost all of my life. Um, I did also study in the UK um, for a while. And before that, I studied in an English school in Cyprus. So I kind of had this like, you know, I spent a few years basically um, speaking English, writing in English. And that's this for like my very formative years. So, you know, because of that, I was kind of, I had a good command in English and everything. And I wanted to write in English. And I was looking for a sort of ways to, do that in Ukraine. And when I came back after finishing a university in England, um, I emailed uh, the Kiev Post. I don't know if your readers would know that. I mean, if they are interested in Ukraine, they probably will know that it's like the oldest, largest um, uh, media outlet in Ukraine, which has recently sort of has had like very turbulent times and there was a, a lot to do with that as well, but we're not going to go into that. So I emailed the chief editor of the Kiev Post and I asked them, I asked the editor for an internship and he gave it to me. And then after that, I stayed working, you know, when the internship finished, I sort of remained working there. And since that, I then worked at Hermatsky International, another English language outlet. So that time when I sort of started all of this, it was like 2016, 2017. Um, there were not really many people, um, you know, who were Ukraine based and reporting on Ukraine in English. And um, so it was like a, you know, very, I don't know how to describe, it was a very interesting time. I think now there's definitely a lot more of that happening, but that was my start. Uh, with that and then since then I have done a bit of you know freelancing um, right now I don't actually have like I don't report on Ukraine full time but because of the events I've been like a lot more involved um, recently because of everything going on now and there's so much interest um, so yeah but since then I have done a couple of uh, freelancing thing uh, I wrote something for the Guardian I wrote um, for um, other outlets <laughs> Well, so that, you've, that's you, my story. For those, for my Canadian listeners and to my Canadian viewers, you might have seen uh, Maria on Global News. You might have seen her on CTV mm -hmm. here in Canada as well. So, uh, I, when I was doing research and trying to find the perfect guest for this show, I was looking and I was trying to find, and then actually it was Twitter that brought me to your attention of uh, a post that you recently did of you with a bracelet. And <laughs> I, I, I did some research on you and I said, this is the perfect person. I need to have her on my show to try to help me digest this and try to understand this issue. So again, thank you so much for doing this and thank you for introducing yourself there. Um, All right. Before we get into the tensions that are on the Ukraine-Russian border, I need to talk about the players in this whole ongoing issue. And to start off, let's talk about uh, Ukraine President Zelensky. He was first elected in 2019. And if you have never heard of this gentleman, it, he is a unique figure when it comes to politics. Uh, I think Maria could probably explain it a little bit better, but I'm going to say this. Prior to entering politics, he was a comedian and an actor. 
How does a man who has no political experience go on to become the president of Ukraine? Because I, I just need to know the backstory about this because I'm still in disbelief that it happened. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right, Lisa, that, you know, he's a newcomer to politics. Uh, he first announced uh, his uh, funds to run for president. It was a New Year's Eve, I still remember that. Um, uh, in 2018, going into 2019, um, and even though we were all kind of like talking about it because there were some clues to that, uh, but it was, you know, quite a complete shock to everybody. And I just remember everybody thinking, oh, you know, it's just some sort of joke or, you know, he will run, but it'll not happen. Like he won't become president for various reasons. But it did happen. Um, so, yeah, even though he is a newcomer, he was a newcomer to politics at that point. Like you would probably hardly find a person in Ukraine who wouldn't know who Volodymyr Zelensky is because he, is an, he was an extremely successful, like it's hard for me because I had to keep saying he is, I mean, he's not longer a comedian and but yeah. I don't want to say he was because it's not like, you know, he's, I mean, he's still here, he's still yeah. with us. Um, so I have to like choose my tenses correctly. But anyway, he was a very um, successful um, showman, um, actor, like he's basically built his own kind of comedy empire in Ukraine, uh, going from, don't know, remember the year that when it all started before, um, you know, when the whole Quartal 95, uh, which is the name of it, uh, started, but it was at least 10, 15 years ago. So it's a very, um, it's a very um, sort of long going um, company and, um, what they do basically is kind of like comedy shows. Uh, they have this show called um, uh, Evening Quartal, uh, which is like a comedy kind of like stand up where they have different um, sort of members of the whole team basically doing jokes, um, sort of impersonating politicians, sort of, you know, trying to be funny or, fu or being funny, whatever your views on that are. Um, and that was very, very successful. And then also as part of Quartal 95, they also made various films um, and various events all over Ukraine. Their, their fame kind of went even further than Ukraine. Like I know that definitely in Russia, many people knew about it even before Zelensky became president, knew about him and knew about their shows. So it kind of goes back, you know, all, all the way back to then when they were doing a lot of things um, for a long time. And um, yeah, and Zelensky himself, he also played, he also did a few films. So another thing that I don't think many people talk about, and but I think it's a very curious thing. So he took part in Dancing with the Stars, Ukrainian Dancing with the Stars, and he won it. <laughs> I so obviously, know that. Yeah. So it's, it's quite an amusing I think it's quite an amazing person because it's kind of almost like a lot of the things he did, he was successful in. So it's like, you know, he went to do the dancing thing, probably never danced before. I've never heard of him having any dance background and he won it. He goes into presidency, goes into politics. He becomes the president. Uh, but another curious thing that I, I don't want to go, you know, too long into answering questions. I, I know you probably have a lot of other things you want to ask. But another interesting thing about his story is that um, he played the president before becoming the president. So there was a show um, called The Servant uh, of the People. You know, that's the name of his party now in the parliament. Uh, but before that, that was the name of the TV show. And in the TV show, he played the main role. And it was basically this um, teacher at school that um, like kind of like this unlikely figure that goes from being a, a teacher to becoming a president. Um, so that is an interesting, very interesting fact that he played a president. And then he kind of like almost like manifested all of it. And, you know, he, he himself became a president and was this unlikely candidate to become one and became the president. Now, uh, in Canada, we do not have term limits on our politicians. So you can run and run for as long as you want. I was trying to do some research about Ukrainians' uh, presidential elections. Can the president serve more than one term? Like, 
he can run for re-election in 2024 when the next presidential election is up is is scheduled to happen in ukraine correct yes that's correct uh, yeah we had a I'm trying to remember the history of ukraine how many of our presidents uh, stayed for two terms and how many didn't but yeah, yeah you can definitely two terms is the maximum though you can't do more than two terms okay uh, but but yes but you can stay for you can uh, you can run for re-election yeah um, that's a yeah sorry no, no i'm just going to mention that he said um zelensky himself said before that he was not going to run for a second term um and then i think recently he sort of started changing his mind about that so that's another interesting thing but before he was like telling no 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 it's only one term i'll do everything i want to do in one term but yeah <laughs> let's see what happens in a few years or in, in 2024 um mm. now let's talk about the other player in this ish, in this ongoing tensions on the border and that is russian president vladimir putin I, from a Ukrainian perspective, and I know you are one person and you do not speak for the entire country, what is the views on Vladimir Putin in Ukraine? Is he well liked? Is he uh, uh, is he hated? Like I, I'm just, because you can in the United States, you have that conflict of we look at the U United States and we go, oh, it's Joe Biden, no, it's Donald Trump. So we have our feelings on them and we always are willing to talk about our feelings and how we might dislike or like somebody. In Ukraine, is there a sentiment that Russian is trying to potentially invade here with the uh, tensions that are going on on the border? Or do people like him? Like, what is the sentiment in Ukraine over Vladimir Putin? Well, I think first thing first that needs to be pointed out is that Russia already invaded Ukraine. That happened in 2014. It's now been eight years um, since that happened. Um, so, yeah, the events of the last eight years, you know, it all started with the annexation, illegal annexation of Crimea. Then there was this like staged uh, protests um, all over the Donbass where sort of flags kept ch changing, you know, all of a sudden instead of a Ukrainian flag, there would the Russian flag suddenly pop up and stuff like that. And then all of this different events uh, led to armed escalations and then um, different big battles that led to uh, many, many losses, um, including the ones where Russia's part was proven, like the Battle of Ilovaisk, where you know, it was proven there was Russian troops taking part in that. And then obviously we have MH17, uh, the, you know, the downing of the airplane, of the Malaysian airplane that killed too many Dutch citizens. Um, and obviously that was proven to have had Russian um, part directly, you know, Russia taking direct part in that. So there is no question whether, you know, Russia will invade Ukraine or not, because it already has. Um, there is now the question of whether there will be a further invasion or whether there will be inv an invasion of Kiev, which is what some people have been talking about. Um, your question about Vladimir Putin, whether Ukrainians like him or not, like maybe before 2014, it would have been a bit neither here nor there. I don't think many people had much of an opinion about him other than that it's a neighboring country. Um, and we have had some sort of conflicts with Russia even prior to 2014 because there was some, you know, economic um, sort of kind of, what, how would I call it? Like, basically, you know, if Ukraine would do something that Russia wouldn't like, they would block something in uh, terms of um, economy. And, you know, yeah. there were some, some, some of this sort of things were happening, but, you know, there was no armed conflicts before that between Ukraine and Russia. Um, so I would say probably most people wouldn't have been a massive fan of Vladimir Putin before 2014, but ever since um, 2014, ever since the illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, the majority of people in Ukraine definitely do not like Vladimir Putin. They view Russia as an aggressor. I mean, this, there have been uh, polls where people have been asked about their opinion about Russia in general, about Vladimir Putin. So most people dislike Vladimir Putin. I think most people um, are okay with Russia in general, like they don't sort of translate that 
attitude towards the regular citizens. Um, so, but yeah, I think also most people are aware that, you know, even before 2014, that there was like an invasion of Georgia in 2008, for example, uh, which also led to a lot of um, um, sort of um, like death. We pride ourselves on going beyond that 15 second soundbite by becoming a backer of the show. With a quick visit to patreon.com and searching cross-border interviews, you can help continue this show. For as little as $3 a month, your support can ensure we grow and bring new and exciting things to our growing listenership. Click the link in the show notes and back the show today. That's an interest there. So um, I want to okay. ask I want to ask the follow up question to that then because we we talk about 2014 with the annexation of Crimea to Russia the illegal annexation of Crimea, Crimea to Russia during that 2019 presidential election where Zelensky president well then candidate Zelensky won the election did he talk about any potential further uh illegal annexation, illegal uh, occupation of Ukraine border during that uh, presidential election? Or was it more on social issues and domestic issues like the economy? Like was, was Russia a major factor in that presidential election in 2019? Um, well, I would say one big change uh, between Zelensky, um, our current president, and between our former president Petro Poroshenko, is that Poroshenko is kind of very good on the international arena. Um, he um, did the, you know, everything to do with uh, the like foreign uh, politics, he I think did quite well. Um, I would say uh, Zelensky sort of came in on the note that he would result there was a lot of talk from what i remember there was a lot of talk that he would end the war uh, but it was kind of like he was promising to do a lot of things like he was more focused let's say he was more focused on domestic politics um and he did a few steps to basically reintegrate um the areas of the Donbass that were either sort of cut off after, you know, the the um, the military warfare sort of started in the Donbass and they became uh, occupied by the Russia-led uh, separatists um, or the ones who live near those areas. So there were definitely a few steps that were aimed at reintegrating that those areas that for one reason or another have had that trust in the Ukrainian government um, sort of going down. Um, so I would say he, when he came into power or just before he came into power, he, he was very quite focused on domestic issues. And I remember where the whole sort of Trump Zelensky drama was happening um, and the journalists was, were trying like to get his his um, opinion about things in the US. He even like said at least once he was like, why do we talk about the US so much? Like I'm more concerned what hap what's happening in my country. Like that that was, you know, he kept sort of reiterating that that's his main concern and fixing the things inside Ukraine. Now, prior, it's prior to our, the start of the Get Sense interview, we were doing a bit of a pre-interview question. And I want to talk about the foreign... Uh, foreign media concept that Zelensky is pro-Russia. Uh, he seems to be pro-Russia, and this is just from what I'm reading, and you should never take everything you read to heart because so there's lefts and there's rights, and there are people in the center who do good journalism, but there is a underlying theme that I've been reading that Zelensky has, was seen in that 2019 election as being pro-Russian. Uh, can you take me through what you were talking about beforehand about Ukrainians being divided into two if you only speak Ukrainian or if you speak Russian Ukrainian it's kind of a weird concept 
Uh, yeah, sure, I'll try. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very complex subject as well. Uh, but um, yeah, the Ukraine. I mean, there is only one official language in Ukraine, and that is Ukrainian. Um, a lot of Ukrainians speak Russian. Well, most of Ukrainians speak Russian, and that's to do with um, the Soviet past of Ukraine, where you know Russian was used everywhere on a, any sort of official level or on any work level. You know, it was like the the main language, um, and to this day, you know, Russian has been like when I was when I was uh, studying at a school in Ukraine, I was learning Russian. Um, so it was kind of hard to escape. It was hard to sort of go on for grow up and sort of fill your life without being exposed to Russian or without having to learn it somewhere. Um, so that's why many Ukrainians in a in a very sort of <laughs> um, brief explanation why so many Ukrainians speak Russian. Um, but there seems to be like obviously a lot of so a lot of Ukrainians speak Russian on a daily basis. That's the language they speak most of the time, but a lot of Ukrainians speak Ukrainian on a daily basis. And if you look at the, you know, if you go to the West, you'll find more Ukrainians who speak Ukrainian. But if you go to the East, you'll find more Ukrainians who speak Russian. And that's also to do with um, the history. It's also to do with many events when, you know, when the Soviet Union was um, still existing. It was easy for Russia to send lots of people, like relocate them from one part of the Soviet Union to another, and that's what happened uh, after some events when you know when we had the Holodomor, uh, when we had the um, artificial famine uh, that was created by Stalin um, in the 1930s. Um, that, uh, for example, and a lot of Ukrainians have died because of that, obviously, uh, like millions of Ukrainians and. For example, a big parts of population would be relocated to fill in those parts of uh, Ukraine. And that's how those kind of Russian speaking um, parts would grow and there would be more Russian speakers. Um, so that's why it's kind of like the East tends to be more Russian speaking, but the West tends to be more Ukrainian speaking because of different, different events in the history. Uh, there seems to be this sort of misconception, I would say, um, um, quite common misconception outside of Ukraine that if you predominantly speak Ukrainian, that means you are like pro EU, you're pro West, you are um, pro NATO, for example, and stuff like that. Or if you speak Russian most of the time, therefore you definitely are pro Russian. But that is wrong because. Um, Historically, a lot of um, Ukrainian patriots have been speaking Russian, speak Russian. Um, a lot of soldiers in the East who are trying to ward off this Russian aggression speak Russian. And, you know, that's fine. Um, that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't mean this kind of thing. I saw, I saw this map on Twitter that somebody posted from one of the big media that's saying this is the divide where most people speak Russian uh, in Ukraine or most people speak Ukrainian. And that was kind of all sort of made um, in the context of the military threat that we have now because of the, uh, the, the troops that are at the border. But yeah, it's, it shouldn't be viewed like that. Um, no, I, I appreciate that, but I, I'm just conscious of time and I want to get into the... Mm -hmm the ongoing escalation at the border. Mm. Um, the last number that I read, which uh, there was a news report that came out yesterday was uh, 130,000 Russian troops are on the border of the Russian-Ukraine border. And Ukraine is sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place because the United States, a player that we haven't talked about yet, is saying that they're going to back Ukraine. They're not going to let Ukraine into NATO, but they're going to back Ukraine so Putin doesn't come in. Um, Putin says he doesn't want to invade. He's just doing military exercises. And then Zelensky just recently said that if Russia does invade, there will be an all-out war. What is the sentiment right now in Ukraine 
around the ongoing tensions. Are people preparing for war in Ukraine if Russia does invade? Uh, well, first of all, I think the latest uh, figure that was given by Ukraine, at least, that is the 140,000 oh. um, uh, troops. Um, Canada's numbers are always last to be updated. <laughs> yeah, but that like includes also the air, um, like it includes uh, all of the land, air and things. Um, yeah, secondly, the, the mood uh, in Ukraine is... I think it's mostly like foreigners in Ukraine who are panicking quite a lot to, be, to do because of um, various things, because either there are employers who are outside of Ukraine telling them that they need to evacuate or leave or whatever, make contingency plans, or because um, they read a lot of media and they sort of understandably, uh, they are sort of getting this impression that it's best to leave ASAP. Um, most Ukrainians are not really panic and I would say I mean I go into the streets I you know go to a cafe or something and or a shop like I don't see anybody panicking um the situation seems to be fine it doesn't you don't really see anything changing like you see people just relaxing it's normal I mean there's definitely more talks about these things going on but I don't think many Ukrainians um sort of believe that something imminent will happen in Kiev, for example, or, um, yeah, well, I'm based in Kiev, so I can speak for Kiev. Um, I think from what I saw online, a lot of people sort of try to prepare a, a go bag or whatever, just in case, but I haven't really seen or heard from anybody who is Ukrainian who either moved somewhere outside of Kiev, like closer to the West, uh, you know, to Lviv or somewhere, or outside of Ukraine um, at all because, because of this threat. So there's nobody really like fleeing or, you know, sort of making escape plans from what I know. So that's sort of a short answer. I mean, if you, you can want, if you want to, ask more about specific details or whatever. Like, well, I want to know because from the media reports that I'm reading, there's one corner in the southeastern part of Ukraine that is, according to the media reports, which again, this is CTV, this is global, this is CNN that I'm reading, that is very pro-Russian separatists. They want to leave Ukraine and join with uh, Russia. Now, is there an underlying pro-Russian separatist movement within the Ukrainian population? Or is that a misconception that the media in the West here in the United States and Canada, or even in like other European countries, are portraying onto Ukraine? Um. Again, it's more complicated than it looks like on the surface. So obviously, I think probably all of the all of your listeners will have heard the term hybrid war, like hybrid war in Ukraine, yeah. and it is commonly referred to as a hybrid war, and that is for various reasons, and specifically because it also involves, apart from the actual military warfare, it also involves like economic warfare, which also has been happening. Um, and it also in involves disinformation, which is an interesting thing that not many people in Europe are really accustomed to. I know there's more talks about disinformation now than there were, for example, eight years ago, in 2014. But still, like, Ukraine is a lot more accustomed to something like disinformation. And I would say that this in the information war is definitely plays a, played a big part in everything going on. Um, I don't want to sort of make, you know, estimations and just in case they're, they would not, because I don't know the actual figures, but, you know, I would maybe even go as far as to say that it play, played the biggest part of why we have what we have now, because um, anybody who's watched Russian TV channels, especially state TV channels, but even like, any like even independent Russian media, it's hard to 
stay independent in Russia, because uh, what, from what we know, even with like Deutsche Welle, they had just the Moscow Department of Deutsche Welle that used to report there for years and everything sort of was more or less fine. They just been shut down in response for um, Germany calling Russia today um, a um, sort of banning it and because you know it's calling it a propaganda channel. So um, the Russia's information, like disinformation game, is very very strong, and they've had like years and years to perfect it uh, because that's not you know 2014 is not the as time they started doing it. They've been doing it before that. They've been doing it uh, in Georgia. They've been doing it in Estonia. Uh, there's so many like countries that have had to uh, deal with that. And um, I know your listeners are mostly in Canada, but still like probably the closest example to your listeners would be in the US and in the, in the lead up to the US presidential elections in 2016 when Trump won, um, like it's been proven now that Russia sponsored um, different social media campaigns um, that were very like pro-Trump. Um, so what, where I'm going with this is that there is so much disinformation that is affecting ev everybody's like everyday life. Um, and that happens a lot in the East as well, in the East of Ukraine, where uh, people watch this Russian TV channels because they're close to the border. You know, I think that's quite relatively easy to get that on your TV. And uh, that impacts what they think, that impacts um, how they behave. And, and basically the common message in those social media, in those, sorry, in those um, TV channels, in those uh, media channels is um, that different various conspiracy theories about Ukraine that is like a fascist government, whatever they say there. And then there's like lots of fake stories, fake news about things being done, things being said. And um, so I would say that's why a lot of people start believing that and they kind of start thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe, you know, life in Russia is better or something like that. So yeah, you would probably find a lot of um, pro-Russian people, unfortunately, in the East. Um, but that's also part of this uh, big war that we've had since 2014. It's, you know, as well as a war for um, territories or war for what is this also like a war for mines. So Russia is trying to win over um, a lot of Ukrainian mines uh, in order to get Ukraine back into their influence sphere. So all of this, in my opinion, is um, to Russia can't really like deal with um, losing Ukraine um, from its influence sphere because, you know, supposedly Ukraine was part of the Rus Russia's uh, influence sphere during the Soviet times. And now that we've been an independent country for 30 years and we're sort of trying to move away from Russia, you know, look into the direction of the European Union and NATO, like Russia just can't really accept that. And um, they try in, in various ways to win Ukrainian minds and back into its sphere of influence we 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 are seeing the rise of fake news across this this world i think 2016 sort of blew up the idea of fake news and with the rise of donald trump with the rise of uh influence from, from foreign countries um i want to talk about the future though and talk about the future of the ongoing escalation on the border because I'm just an observer. You're living it. You are living in the country and you are living the day-to-day -day realities of this ongoing tensions. What is the next step that Ukraine has to take to de-escalate this issue or potentially resolve this issue? Like, I, I'm just trying to find what the end game is and I, I, I don't see it. And you might be able to tell me a little bit better about what the end game is for Zelensky or the end game for Putin, but yet again, we're not those people, so you don't know. But is there a sense on the ground or in Ukraine that the only way to resolve this is with war or is with just basically building up the border between Russia and Ukraine and hoping to God that Russia doesn't invade? What is the end game? 
yeah, I mean, there was a talks uh, that reminded me that um, I think 2015 when there was like this talks about building a wall, a wall <laughs> between Ukraine and Russia, but then it was just kind of um, mostly, I think, made fun of that idea in general. Um, but um, I personally, like, I think, I don't think there's much you, Ukraine can do other than keep sort of working together with the Western partners and um, doing well in terms of um, giving the best information and informing the Western partners as much as it can um, in order that, you know, that the international partners know what's going on and support keep supporting Ukraine. Uh, yeah, the, the reason why I say it can't really do much, like, I don't know, because we are under attack and um, there's not much Ukraine can do as a smaller country than Russia. Um, we have been defending our territories since, since 2014. Um, uh, Russia's... So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna oh. clarify something because you just said something that I want to make sure I get on record here and just ask the follow up question. You said Ukraine is under attack, even with Russia not entering Ukraine. Do you do you feel like Ukraine is constantly being attacked by Russia because of with that disinformation campaign that they might have the ongoing escalation the rise of troops that are on the border is that what you mean or can you just flush out what you mean by always under we feel ukraine is under attack i just want to make sure i know what you mean by that yes of course i mean um yeah more than fourteen thousand people have died uh in the war um in the donbass since uh 2014 uh, lots more injured people um a lot of soldiers who come back from the war they commit suicide. So actually more Ukrainian soldiers have died from suicide than they have done, died from the warfare. And that's to do with PTSD that they get from um, being there. Um, so yes, of course, Ukraine is, has been constantly under attack. And if it's, if it's not people dying, then it's the economy that is suffering. I think actually just today there was an article that why how much Ukraine has lost uh, because of the Russian aggression and that was like billions of uh, I don't I don't want to give a, a number just in case I don't remember it but it was definitely like in, in billions. Um, so you know our economy is under attack, our daily lives are under attack. Like we even from the perspective of like just the lifestyle of the Ukrainians daily lifestyle like we can't go to Crimea and a lot of people used to go there for holiday for example um, there was many there's been many many cyber attacks that have affected things in Ukraine so yeah of course like it's not even a question I think for most most Ukrainians would tell you that uh, this eight years uh, the the complications of the war that has started in 2014 have been felt on a daily basis. Um, and yeah, and the, there is a threat that potentially could get worse um, with um, what is Russia, what, what Russia is doing now and um, trying to achieve by positioning their troops at the border. We are seeing a rise in foreign leadership. We saw Boris Johnson, meet, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson of the United Kingdom, meet with uh, President Zelensky of the Ukraine. We have seen uh, Emmanuel Macron, the President of uh, France, go meet President Putin and then meet uh, President Zelensky. Is this going to take a world uh, solution or is this going to have to come down to Zelensky and Putin just basically sitting down in a room and coming up with a solution like I, I is is this potentially leading to a bigger world conflict than just a conflict between uh, Russia and the Ukraine um well I feel like personally I don't think Putin would be interested in invading Kiev for example I just think that would be a very silly idea like I just don't think 
I mean, you never, I would, I would never like rule anything out, like, because I know he's uh, capable, Putin is capable of um, some very crazy things. But personally, I don't think that's his end goal. I just feel like, first of all, I just don't see, I just don't see how that would happen in practice. Like Kiev, you know, is so opposed to Russian aggression. Like the citizens of Kiev would just never, never like take that, would never accept that. Um, secondly, like historically Kiev has just been through so much. Like it's such a, you know, Kiev has got such a rich history, it's ridiculous. And we have sustained so many things and we're still here. We're, you know, it's still going. And I, I just, I don't see it happening. Personally, what I think, I, what I think Putin is trying to achieve is make Ukraine concede something. I want, I'm not going to say exactly what, because it's, uh, I don't know what it would be, but I feel like the goal was, you know, to sort of intimidate Ukraine, intimidate the rest of, um, the rest of the world uh, by, you know, positioning all these troops and sort of making everybody believe that Russia is going to invade. Um, and, but in reality, through all of these talks, because what we're seeing after, um, after, for example, Putin met up with Macron, um, we're seeing this, uh, Putin sort of keeps repeating this thing, oh, well, Ukraine needs to stick to Minsk agreements. And, you know, this, this whole sort of thing is being brought up that Ukraine, Ukraine needs to do something, Ukraine needs to do something, uh, which is ridiculous because first of all, why does Ukraine need to do something? Like, you know, we've been encircled everywhere, almost all, all the sides. And then somebody tells us, oh, we, you need to do this. But it's like, but we're just trying to live our peaceful lives. We're just trying to go on about, you know, things as normally. So the reason, I, and I keep getting this like increased um, feeling that the end goal of all of this is to make Ukraine concede because of this, how often like Minsk agreements come up and stuff like that. So to me, it just feels um, like, and it's, uh, you know, it's important to say like as part of the Minsk agreements, there's this like talks about Ukraine having to give like a special status to the Donbass and um, things like this. But basically Ukraine's position throughout all of this time has been that Ukraine will not hold elections in the Donbass on a special status or any sort of referendum, anything in the Donbass until the troops are gone, until the, the you know, until there's, a, there's no more troops and no more like uh, foreign aggression in there. Um, but I th what I think Putin is trying to achieve is for Ukraine to agree to have some sort of referendum or elections in those areas. And then that would give him a precedent, precedent uh, to say, well, look, the people have voted. They said that they want to be closer to Russia for in one way, one way or another, you know, be annexed or whatever. So I feel like that's the goal to sort of make Ukraine give up something. And I don't know if it's basically give Russia the, the green flag to uh, the green light to um, annex the Donbass or if it's anything else um, there's been talks about you know like Finlandization and stuff like that like basically but it's yeah it's um, I feel like the end goal is to make Ukraine give up something I don't think the end goal is an all-out invasion um, I think it's more like to um, give this pretext give this like illusion of a big threat well it's not just an illusion obviously there's the actual troops there uh, and to make the west say to ukraine well you know we've tried everything you have to agree to this or something like this i feel like that's the end goal to leave ukraine with no choice other than say okay well you know at least that's better than an all-out war i feel like that's what they're trying to achieve i'm gonna ask a stupid question but i like asking stupid questions from time to time do you think, or is there a sentiment within the Ukrainian public that Zelensky's up for the job to hold off Putin when it comes to this ongoing tension and this war and potentially negotiating with him? Um, no, it's not just Zelensky. Like his, I know sometimes it feels like all of our politics is just Zelensky alone and, you know, kind of rightfully so. I know why there can be that impression because 
you know, he's the president, his party is, has got the absolute majority in the parliament and things like that. But then we also have like, you know, it's not just Zelensky, we have like a great uh, foreign minister, we have Dmitry Kuleba um, as the foreign minister. We have many, many people in our government who are doing great things. Um, so I feel like a lot of that has to be, you know, we have to be grateful to those people as well. It's not definitely not just Zelensky doing things. Um, with regards to whether he can solve this, like as I mentioned earlier, is that he's been very sort of um, kind of focused more on the domestic uh, politics when he came in. Uh, I feel like to some extent that uh, played a, a play, played a like a good role, a good part in um, resolving the conflict. Obviously, nothing can be resolved until the troops are gone, and until not, not and not just from the borders, but also from out, from the Donbas until there is a you know the the supply of the weapons is stopped and things like that. Um, but also. But I think what Zelensky has been doing in terms of reintegrating and kind of trying to um, win the hearts of uh, people living in the East back, I think that was uh, definitely probably, a, you know, a very good thing to do. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what Ukrainian sentiments are, whether he can end the war or not. I feel like that is definitely not up to the president of Ukraine to end the war. It's, it's uh, up to the president of Russia. Um, so. Yeah, and I probably would say probably most of, people, of the people in Ukraine would say that, um, and, but it's been going on for eight years now. Um, I feel like a lot of Ukrainians maybe have lost hope uh, by this time and they kind of got a bit, you know, accustomed to what's going on. Um, well, just on that but note, yeah, but just on that note alone, because here in Canada, even in the States, when when people get just relaxed about their politicians that's when politicians go into a moment of we're just going to keep doing what we're doing and nothing's going to change and that's when people get a little bit tense and they get a little bit more frustrated at their politicians for not doing more um so by the sounds of it and correct me if i'm wrong here it sounds like the people of ukraine understand where this uh this government is uh, with Zelensky, his foreign minister, his people, the, the the politicians in parliament. And they're okay with where it's going right now, but is there a potential moment where the people might turn on Zelensky and his government and say, okay, you need to step up your game. You need to step up your game because we're sick and tired of being in a continuous war with Russia. We're sick and tired of Russia be using us as a area just to try to get something from, whether it be Crimea, whether it be the Dunbar. So is the is there a moment where you see where the people might start turning on Zelensky and his government and saying, okay, enough's enough. We need to do something or we're not going to reelect you in two years. Well, again, I don't know what else Zelensky could do. Like, That's true. Uh, you're asking this question. <laughs> you're asking these questions, but I don't know what he can do. Like, you know, he's not going to turn up at Putin's door, go to, all the way to Moscow and turn up at his door and, you know, force him to stop things. Like, no, I, I, I feel like he's doing, I feel like he's doing all he can in terms of his, of his foreign politics. Um, so I yeah I just I don't no. see what people have been demanding more of him in, on the international arena. I mean, there's definitely things inside of Ukraine that would need to be fixed, but that's a whole different uh, conversation. In terms of uh, international arena, um, I feel like in, in the context of the Russian-Ukrainian war, there's not much more a Ukrainian any Ukrainian president, not just could do in this situation. So as a, going back to what you asked me before, so it's like just a matter of making sure Ukraine's got this international support. And I think actually recently there have been some very good steps in that direction. Um, yeah. Um, my last question before we go, because I, I just, I'm cautious of time here and I want to start our wrap up here is what, what would you want the people of 
Canada, the world to know about what's going on in Ukraine that we haven't talked about, because I feel like we have digested a little, like, like 10% of the bigger picture of what's going on in the Ukraine, uh, Russian uh, tensions and conflict and war. What would you want them to know that we haven't talked about? Um, I feel like in the in the environment of all this sort of constant news and um, you know reports about politicians talking things and things happening at the border and troops and weapons being sent and stuff like that, I feel like it's very easy to forget that it's also about humans and there's at least 42 million Ukrainians living here. And it's the, you know, it's the largest country in Europe. There's many people living here who are affected by everything going on daily. And whether it's direct um, impact on them because they had to, you know, their house was destroyed because of the war. They had to move somewhere else. They had to rebuild their life. And that's actually what happened to my relatives. Um, they had to move uh, outside of the Donbass. Uh, or if it's, you know, less direct, but, but you know, it's to do more on the, um, uh, the stress that it's causing them, or it's something to do with economy, or, you know, it's basically it's affecting the everyday lives of 42 million Ukrainians who are just in Ukraine, but then also they have a large diaspora, diasporas outside of Ukraine. So I feel like it's very, in all of this events and fast news cycle, it's easy to forget that there's um, so many of us who are being affected by all of this. And that's why I think we, you know, we all want this to end. We all want to have a peaceful life. And we are grateful for all the support we're getting from our international partners. You know, we always kind of every single time there's like weapons being uh, flied to Ukraine, uh, flown to Ukraine, we are very grateful for that or, you know, whatever anybody's doing outside of Ukraine, we're always um, grateful for that support. And that means a lot to us. So I think it's important to remember that there's people like me um, and so many more of us who are just being affected by this. And it's important to remember this human side of the conflict. And I appreciate that. Um, Maria, before we go, I have one last question and it's kind of, not not in the realm of the uh, last 45 minutes, 50 minutes of conversation that we've had, but how can people follow you? How can people learn more about you? Because uh, we have we have this great thing called the internet where people can get in touch with people across the world. So how can, can do you have social media? Where can people follow you? Uh, yeah, well, I think the best uh, place would be on Twitter. So it's at Romary, so uh, R-O-M-A-R-I. Um, I think I have my direct message. Well, I definitely have my direct messages all, uh, open. So uh, you can message me on there. You can tweet at me or whatever you um, like to do. Um, so yeah, um, on Twitter. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's the best way. Uh, for anyone who uh, who knows uh, who's listened to the show or watched the show before, um, the links to Maria's uh, Twitter is going to be in the show notes. So scroll down, and you will see them on YouTube or go back to the page beforehand if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple Podcast, and check her out because. Um, she is quite the colorful person on Twitter and I would highly recommend you go out and a follower because she is a resource that people need in this world. Maria, I want to thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure and uh, stay safe. I, I understand now that there is a human com com component to this issue and I hope my listeners do too. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you for having me and thank you for everybody listening. So with, for that, for everyone here at the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, just keep talking. Get off social media for five minutes and have a conversation with someone. Talk to you later.